What's going on, Trek snobs? Welcome back to another episode of Warp Factor Fiction. We love having you here, and we love doing this show where we are re-watching, in chronological order, all of Star Trek. I'm your host, Mick Manhattan, joined, as always, by Ensign Tommy Manhattan, and we're going to take you on this journey through the Trek and see what we come out with on the other side. Right now, we're on Discovery Season 2, and we're back after a long summer apart. Tommy, welcome how you doing, man? I'm doing really good. I had a really good summer. It was really fun. So uh, as you guys know, Tommy is my uh, stepson, and he was at his dad's for the summer. And we're back again. We watched Discovery Season 2. So, you know, tell us a little bit about your summer. You don't have to go too in-depth. But, you know, like, did you do anything fun that kind of stood out to you? I went to the beach a few times. That was fun. So you're a regular Cisco. That's your captain, huh? Like going to the beach? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the only captain I could think of. Maybe, maybe, maybe Riker. Riker would go to the beach go to Ryza and just hang out but i want to say thanks for jumping back in had a good time we watched discovery season two we're getting into it so before we get started and before we go over every episode transferring and taking that time off like it's almost like eight weeks two months or something like that where you watch season one versus season two did it hold up like like that that two month break where you like fatigued by trek or were you into it were you happy to get back into it i was actually pretty i was happy to get back into it it was different than not watching it as much it yeah. was different because it wasn't as spread out yeah it was kind of it was kind of rushed into it and i know you had pretty eventful summer so like uh you know i, I completely get why you didn't watch any during the summer neither did i so like we had the kind of mad dash last week you were watching it as you were going during the day i was after i was finished work and i'd be watching it so it was fun but we got there and we're here to record so let's get into the second season of discovery we'll go episode by episode and kind of talk about it how's that sound yeah. all right let's start so where we left off in season one of course the our crew of discovery has defeated the bad guys and the klingons attacking all over they've made their peace their treaty with them they are continuing to rebuild and after Lorca's destruction of everything coming over from the mirror universe they're going on their way to get a new captain until they are hailed by a damaged uss enterprise that's right the ncc 1701 but captained by none other than christopher pike played by anson mount this is where we first see him in action before we get start strange new worlds and everything else i gotta say getting into this first episode which is called brother in season two you know discovery picks up captain pike he's an acting captain for them at the moment and the whole journey here is he needs to find spock and he needs michael's help to find him that's his sister so that's what it's all about at the moment now before we get into any more episodes, I'd love to know what you thought about this first episode. Seeing Pike, seeing the Enterprise, it was a big deal when it first came out. And now we're going to get Spock too, which is an iconic character. What was this first episode like when you watched it? So it seemed to have like a different vibe than the first season. I think it was a little bit funnier i liked the introduction of jet reno yeah on the asteroid tignataro joining up the crew as an engineer and, and she brings a lot to it i think she's a great character going forward you know she's a, she has that dry wit that sarcasm that really is sort of the antithesis of what we see in star trek normally but i feel like it works it brought it breathing like a new life into it yeah i like pike as well yeah pike is pretty yeah he's he's he's, he's like one of the first captains in the enterprise he, he's not the first robert april was but uh he is one of the one of the first captains in the enterprise one of the originals uh, of the ncc of course and he's just he's dashing and he's like heroic so it's kind of cool to see him there i I like the Red Angel as well. The Red Angel storyline, I think, was good. Yes, and now that we're getting into it, the Red Angel storyline is a big one throughout. Uh, it plays really big into where this season goes. It's the mystery for most of it, but you know, it's the MacGuffin, if you will, for most of us film fans out there. So for you, let's let's kind of get in. Well, who's your highlight character for that first episode? Probably Pike, because he was like a big introduction, and I like to character as well burnham was a close second yeah burnham's always good for you know being a highlight character she's fantastic on the show uh sneak martin green all right so we get into episode two new eden confronted with the log entry pike reveals spock committed himself to a psychiatric unit one week after taking leave and requested Starfleet to inform neither Burnham nor his, nor their parents. Discovery detects another signal and uses the experimental spore drive to travel to it, finding a planet with a previously unknown human population. A looped transmission suggests the population de uh, departed Earth during World War III. Pike and Burnham led an away team to the surface, finding a primitive society with a religion combining multiple faiths. As the investigation continues, an anomaly produces an extinction-level radiation shower. Ensign Sylvia Tilly, acting on fellow Ensign's advice, 
uses a sample from the asteroid's non-baryonic matter to avert the catastrophe. Tilly later recognizes the ensign May Mayahim, a high school student classmate who died five years earlier. Pike reviews footage from the helmet camera belonging to the founding member of the society, which shows the red angel bringing the population to Terra Elysium from Earth. So this is where we really, like we, we get introduced to the red angel, but this is where Pike is now made aware. Uh, Spock is a little more involved in what the red angel may be. How do you feel by the mm -hmm. time you get to the second episode, the story line is going i think it is leading up to that point like at that time i thought it was leading to they will learn it and i thought the red angel would be the main antagonist of the series okay that I, I get that yeah um and that sort of makes sense you know and the thing i like about the main antagonist of the series in this isn't it isn't any like particular thing you know or or species or anything like that you just have you're you're kind of running into some issues of course and like you're running into turmoil anywhere and there are people who against you what i mean by that is like it, it is more about the crew than it is the crew has to face a certain entity you know a certain type of bad guy which you see mostly which in star trek kind of works you know what i mean like yeah you have your wars in like the ds9s and and other shows but this is one where it's like they have to try and figure out a mystery and i kind of like that aspect of it so that's season, that's episode two who's your highlight character for episode two i couldn't really pick one it was either pike or burnham though with telly wasn't going to be like in the running but that was the next one if pike and burnham weren't it i kind of like tilly in this one i thought tilly was good tilly seeing her friend who passed away from years earlier um kind of haunting her it, it brings like this different like feel and vibe to it i kind of liked how it went but i i'd probably pick michael burnham if i had to pick anyone episode three point of light amanda grayson spock's mother and burnham's adoptive mother learns that spock has escaped the psychiatric unit and is wanted for murdering three doctors she steals his medical records and takes them to discovery for decryption. Grayson recognizes a drawing in the records from Spock's childhood art, the Red Angel. Burnham admits to emotionally hurting Spock when they were young to protect him from Vulcan's logic extremists. On Quonos, Klingon house leader Cole Shaw threatens to kill Starfleet officer Ash Tyler, formerly the Klingon Vogue. There's so much to the show. <laughs> And the Klingons Emperor Empire's leader, uh, Laurel, for having a secret child together. Pair Kal Shah with the help of Philippa Giorgio, the Empress of the Mirror Universe's Terran Empire, who is now an agent of <laughs> Starfleet Selective Section 31. In a ruse to consolidate power, Laurel convinces the Klingon High Council that Tyler and the baby are dead. Giorgio delivers the baby to a monastery and recruits Tyler to Section 31. Burnham and engineer Paul Stamets Use dark matter to remove a parasite from Tilly that caused her hallucination of May. Man, these episodes have a lot going on. This was a good episode, though. You really got into what's going on with the Klingons. And yeah, do. you do. Yeah, and it, 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 it's pretty fierce, uh, to be honest you know, kind of how it's playing out. And I, you know, even though they're not the main antagonist in this, uh, in this season, it's good that they're back. You know, they were such a prevalent force you know so it, and, and i know it was a way to bring ash tyler back and kind of have that section 31 area what'd you think about this episode though I, it was one of my favorites but i did like it i like the way that they faked the ash tyler and the baby's death i like the way that they did that yeah you know i like this episode too I, i'm glad they kind of removed the baby aspect from it and brought tyler back into the fold put laurel back in some sort of power yeah, it, it's kind of, you know, it, it was a way to kind of write them out and write themselves out of the circle of the baby existing. And not to say that it doesn't come back or get tied up down the line, but it's just one of those things where it's like, let's get our, these characters back in action. We have to get that storyline sort of out of the way for right now. So I do, I don't mind episodes like this. What did you think of the whole episode and who was your highlight character? I liked it. It wasn't my favorite, but I did like it. With the Klingons, I think the reason that they did this episode was more for later later in the season to like bring back for the final fight because mm. i don't think they would have been as close allies if not for Giorgio doing that okay all right makes sense and my highlight character would be it's kind of a weird one i don't think you would have this i think i i had ash tyler down as okay highlight. cool well, well you want to elaborate on that since it's like a different character that you haven't picked before i think he did well i like the acting in this one 
for him. I like the way that he left Quonos as well. Very cool. I just overall liked him as a character for this season, especially this episode. I think this was his best episode, though. Ash Tyler. I, like I do agree with you. Uh, I would say mine, uh, you know what? I would go with Ash Tyler, too. I think he did a great episode. This was his episode, The Shine. And uh, I would give it to him. I would definitely give it to him. All right, let's go on to episode four. Episode four, a living, intelligent, planetoid-sized sphere pulls Discovery out of warp and immobilizes. The crew surmises that the sphere is well-intentioned and has gathered huge amounts of data from all over the galaxy that it does not want to be lost before it dies. However, the sphere holds on Discovery's triggers and the Vahari in Commander Saru, a fatal condition to his species, the Kelpians. The sphere transmits its trans uh, its information to the crew and dies, re releasing Discovery so that it will not be caught in the en ensuing explosion. Saru asks Burnham to help him prepare for his death by removing his threat ganglia, which sense danger. However, they fall out on their own and leave Saru healthy and living without the overwhelming fear his species is known for. Meanwhile, the parasite attaches itself to Tilly again, once again accessing her memories to communicate as a hallucination of May. The, tr the parasite claims Discovery has nearly destroyed the ecosystem by using its species' mycelial uh, network to jump through space and the spore drive. It then consumes Tilly, leaving no trace of her. Ooh. Uh, this episode was good. I thought it was a good episode. I just didn't love it. Uh, my, you know, It just didn't stand out too much for me, but I did like it. I did really like Doug Jones in it. He, Saru is my standout character. But uh, I'd love to know what you thought, especially getting a little more of a backstory to Saru and the Kelpians. This was definitely a setup episode for a bunch of other things that would happen later. This was, I don't think this was meant to be like one of those. I don't think this was one of the episodes that were meant to like pop. I think this was more of like a setup episode for a bunch of things later in the season. Because like you have the spear, the sphere, which is a big thing. Saru helps later with that. And Tilly, which is next episode, which was also really I have yeah. Saru as my highlight though. Very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. I, I think he worked out perfect in it. All right. Uh all right. Num uh episode five is what we're on. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Saints of Imperfection. Stamets and Burnham conclude that Tilly has been taken to the Mycelial Network. She wakes up there with the May Parasite who wants to help her stop a monster ravaging their world. Discovery finds the shuttle Spock used to escape the psychiatric unit, only to discover Jojo on board. Section 31 Captain Leland assigns Tyler to Discovery as a liaison to ensure that Discovery does not interfere in Section 31's own investigation into Spock. Discovery conducts a half jump into the mycelial network to give Stamets and Burnham limited time to find Tilly before the network consumes the ship. Burnham and Stamets discover the monster is Stamets' husband, Hugh Culber, the former Discovery medical officer who Tyler murdered during the war. Stamets was connected to the network when Kolber died, allowing Kolber's energy to be recreated by the spores. Burnham now convinces May to use the parasite cocoon on Discovery, through which Tilly transported him to rebuild Kolber's body in a normal space. They leave the network with Kolber and Tilly. So this episode we thought was good. It brings back uh, uh, Kolber with Dr. Kolber, which is sort of the big for this. And I just think it, I think this worked. Uh, I like that to kind of get you out of discovery for a little bit because the past few episodes like yeah we have been seeing other things but like it's been really just about discovery and then going into the mycelial network what'd you think of this i also think this was a bit of a setup episode it was also the climax of the tilly storyline i really love the culver storyline though for this i liked his character and the second season very good yeah yeah I, I like how they brought him back into it i guess it all works it's star trek you know you can bring people back why not he wasn't wearing a red shirt yeah it was a good episode uh didn't like jump out at me but i did like it i like i've been like more uh, with this season i like the pike heavy episodes more and this one a lot of setup in that first few few episodes and this was one of them i'm glad they tied up the tilly storyline in it but other than that i was just kind of like all right let's 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 finish tying up and move on let's see what we got going on with the red angel that's just kind of where I'm at as I was watching. You know, for you, you you like the episode though, right? This one of your... Yeah, this was one of my favorites. It's not top three, but yes, it is top five. Okay, cool. All right, uh, who's your highlight character? Colber. Colber, really? Okay, Colber is a good character in this. I really liked Colber. Yeah, I'd probably go Colber or Tilly, personally. Yeah, Tilly's a second place for me. Yeah, she did a really good job. All right, let's move on to the next one, which is The Sounds of Thunder, and our second to last episode on this episode of Warp Factor Fiction, which are shorter episodes because for the next few months, we will be covering short 
season shows. This is 14 episodes. Strange New Worlds is going to be 10. Season one's 10, and second is 10. So we might only be doing one episode or two very short episodes. So please bear with us. But we are getting back into the original series sometime in November. And we all know how many episodes that is. <laughs> so, but see, episode six, The Sound of Thunder, another of the mysterious signals, leads discovery to Saru's homeworld of Kaminar, uh, where this the fearful Kelpians are preyed upon by predators called the Balu. Ba'ul? The Ba'ul. Yeah, the Ba'ul. Yeah, I couldn't remember what they were saying. Who demand that Pike surrender Saru to them since Starfleet has agreed to stay out of the conflict between the two species. Pike refuses, but Saru turns himself over to prevent a fight. Tilly works with the technolo technologically augmented uh, Lieutenant Commander Arium. Arium? Arium. Yeah, Arium. To sift through the Sphere's information in Cam Kaminar. Uh, they learn that the fearless post Vahari Kelpians were once Kaminar's dominant species and nearly eradicated the Baul. The <laughs> these names don't. The latter were only able to survive using their superior technology to cull Kelpian before they lose their threat ganglia and become fearless. Pike uses the Baul's trig uh, technology trigger Vahari. Uh, and all Kelpians, hoping their species can instead work towards a peaceful solution once Kelpians are freed. The Ba'ul retaliate against Starfleet's actions by attempting genocide on the Kelpians, but are stopped by the Red Angel, whom Saru sees as a humanoid wearing a highly advanced suit. That is a big deal in this storyline. We finally get an idea of what the Red Angel might be. Iron Man, of clearly. Um, <laughs> that's kind of where we're at with this, but uh, this is a great episode. I really love this episode. I love seeing the Kelpians and the Baul sort of going at it, you know, and, and like what their backstory is, and like kind of learning more about Saru. And he's my shining character. I thought he did great. Mm -hmm. What what is your take? I liked the episode. It was not one of my favorites. It was good. It was kind of like mid tier for the season really? to me. It was a good episode. It was like six or seven, but like not top five. Yeah, I got. It. I, I and, see. For me, it's a little different. This is top five. What you said about. About, um it's being iron man i just realized that what they could have done with the red angel they could have gotten robert downey jr to play it i did like the way that the kelpians lost their vahari at the end of it like i liked the way that that happened mm -hmm. yeah and it too. is a good and it is a good uh setup like it's kind of like the zindi human war i think like kelpians Vaul, or maybe yeah i see what you, i see the correlation you're trying to make with it and, and you've seen really not many wars in the star trek world so like comparisons would be to zindi and it does make sense i see the correlation you're trying to make there um it's not quite exactly if that you know if mm -hmm. you understand what i'm saying like it's because it, that was more of a that was like a now you guys we talked about on those episodes that was their way of sort of recreating what happened on 9 11 to sort of deal with what was going on in the real world at the time mm -hmm. this is a this is something where we're kind of seeing seeing it from the perspective of like slavery you know oppressed people kind of standing against and mm -hmm. good stepping in front of like so i see what you're saying but it's like the precipice for what started that war versus like where, where this goes. It's just a little bit different. So, mm -hmm. but I see your point. Uh, it's a good point. So who's your highlight character you said? Saru. Yeah, I'm with you on that. 100%. Hands down. Cannot stop. Saru is the best. I don't think he's the best in this episode. Yes, but I don't think he's the best like character overall. I think he is. All right. Let's go. All right, on to episode seven in our last episode of this episode of War Factor Fiction. Light and Shadows. Discovery is confronted by the time anomaly. While researching the Red Angel signal over Kam Kaminar, Pike and Tyler investigate the anomaly in a shuttlecraft, sending a probe into it. That same probe soon returns through the anomaly, having been upgraded with future technology. It attacks the shuttle and secretly infects Arium's augmentations using the shuttle's computer system. Pike and Tyler destroy the probe with Stamets' help as his exposure of the mycelial network allows him to ignore the time discrepancies in the anomaly. Meanwhile, Burnham visits Vulcan as she continues to search for Spock <laughs> confronting Grayson, Burnham learns that their mother has been hiding Spock, who is in psychological distress and repeating phrases and series of numbers. Their father, Sarek, instructs Burnham to trust Starfleet, take Spock to Section 31 to fix his mind. Section 31's doctors claim they can help him, but Giorgio warns that Spock will not survive the memory extractor that Section 31 plans to use on him. Giorgio helps Burnham stage an attack and allows Burnham and Spock to escape the ship. 
this was a big deal. This is a big one to go out on mm -hmm. mid season. So for you, uh, you know, for, all right. So I'll talk about it real quick. First for me, this episode, probably one of my top two. Mm -hmm. It's a very good episode. It's a high octane. There's a lot going on. We finally get Spock. It's really what we've been waiting for into the turn. And I really like the dynamic of it all. I like that Amanda was in on it. You know, the mother was in on it and uh, just so much going on here playing into it. You know, you have so much tensions kind of rising and so many questions being asked in section 31 being the antagonist, but still not being the antagonist, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But I did really like this episode. I thought they did such a great job setting up for the second half. What's your take on that? I think this was a really amazing episode. I think it was more about like setting up section 31 as the bad guy. I really like Giorgio in this episode. I think this was her, her like, big moment for this season. Yeah, this she episode. Did. I mean, Michelle Yao, you put her on screen, she tears every bit of scene. So, I don't know. I think, for me, I would probably put Burnham as my highlight, but Giorgio was. I, I have Giorgio, though. Hey, that's fine. No, hey, we can have different. <laughs> don't bother me. Mm -hmm. Great choice. Fantastic. And that's another episode of War Factor Fiction. Before we uh, finish off, though, I do want to ask you your question about this uh, series. One, who's your main, in this first half of the series, who's your, uh, your main character that's like your shining character? Mm -hmm. I think it's Burnham. Even though I didn't really ha have her for many as the main character for an episode, she was always, like, close. And I don't think there's really any other character who can do that except for maybe Pike and Saru. But I do have Burnham as the main, with Pike at second and Saru in third. Nice. Top three. I like it. Uh, what's a what's a part of the season that really stood out to you that you really liked the most? Or, or maybe, like, a storyline or something? The CGI was amazing. Yeah. Well, actually, I wanted to ask you that. Comparatively to a show that of, like, Enterprise, that took place in like the early 2000s uh, you know 20 years ago or so what do you feel about that like like what in your eyes what's the how does that difference hold up you know you're watching a show that takes place only about 100 years or so after enterprise that takes place but is vastly more uh you know has vast amounts more visual effects and 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 technology and things and things like that i'd love to know your take and how you're kind of marrying the whole franchise when i when I first, like, started to see the Enterprise, I had my, like, things like, oh, it's go not going to look like the original Enterprise. It's going to look more, like, technologically advanced because CGI is better. It did, but at the same time, it looked just like the Enterprise. It just looks like it was cleaner, almost. Not, like, cleaner like the one was dirty, but, like, smoother and such. I see what you're saying. Yeah, because, I mean, you're using a model versus using a, uh, you know, CGI. And I, I got to tell you, honestly, like, uh, I, I, I never mind it. That's always my suspension of disbelief. I know it's going to get better and better as the years go on. But it's okay, because I still want to pretend in my mind that the Captain Kirk's Enterprise is the same exact one as Pike. Even though you see Pike's... Well, and I'm talking about this merely from the show standpoint. I'm not talking about Pike from the Kelvin timeline. I'm not talking about Pike from the original series. I'm talking about this Pike, Anson Mount, versus William Shatner's the, the, the NCC 1701, not NCC 1701, not the A. The advancements, I can always be okay with because I always want to see this is one story i love that this is legacy everything's legacy everything's connected nothing is out of connection it all makes sense within the franchise and i and i don't get tired of it so i you know, i do enjoy that about this i do and i don't mind that discovery and strange new worlds and stuff look better than the original series the original series is still fun mm-hmm and that's what the key that's the key to star trek it should be fun right mm -hmm. it should be it should be you're absolutely right so all right well uh great so what's that what is something you've learned from the season and what is something like a takeaway or something that like maybe a piece of technology or or a lesson that you learned that comes from watching the season it was from the tilly storyline and it was even if you can't see something it could still be hurting something like with the spore drive how it like would hurt the mycelia that's beautiful that's a beautiful sentiment i love that that's a great lesson to learn uh and and it's perfect to finish off this episode with so i want to say thank you so much for being a part of it ensign tommy i want to thank you all for watching and listening out there whether you're listening to the podcast or you're watching make sure you please hit like or follow 
wherever you are. It really helps us go a long way. And please either rate and review the podcast wherever you are or subscribe and hit that bell on our YouTube channel because it is a big deal for us. It helps us go and we think you'd really enjoy all the stuff we have coming out. And you're going to want to be aware when the next War Factor Fictions come out. Of course, War Factor Fiction comes out only exclusively on our Patreon for the first month. And there's extra clips and extra things like that that you can see only on Patreon. I want to thank you again, Tommy, for joining in. Thank you all. Uh, I appreciate you and as my old counterpart on the show used to end it and ensign tommy usually ends it you want to take it here pal mm -hmm. live long and prosper until next time take care everybody <laughs>